And we've been playing with Raspberry Pi just a teeny bit and thought it would be humorous to do a pre presentation on this. Who else is familiar with Raspberry Pi? Raise your hands. Quite a few people are familiar with Raspberry Pi. Who's worked with a Raspberry Pi? Not too many people. Okay, it's a small little device like this. $35, case is extra. You uh, get a SD memory chip for it. And uh, it's got USB, Ethernet, HDMI, which is kind of funky. Um, audio out and then uh, video RF. It's amazing some of the things that uh, people are doing with this. Who else is familiar with Asterisk? Who's using Asterisk? Not too many people are using Asterisk. That's good. Asterisk is some software that runs in Linux that acts pretty much like a PBX for the easiest way to introduce that. Um, it uh, does way more than that if you want it to. It's quite complex. Um, why do this? Um, the reason I think that you might want to do this is purely from a standpoint of low cost introduction to VoIP and what you can do with it as far as what you can connect to and features that you can learn on, on how to make it work the way you want it to. Things you're going to need, how soon do you are powered up? Any idea? It's a doll. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I've already explained the Raspberry Pi, like 35 bucks for that. Other things you're going to need, the memory chip, you're going to need a micro uh, power supply. Uh, it's going to be, a, when I say micro, that's the connection that goes into the Raspberry Pi. Uh, from a power standpoint, that's how it does get its power. You're going to want at least probably about a 2 amp power supply. If you're running into flakiness with your Raspberry Pi, get a good power supply that can generally solve an awful lot of ills as far as what's going on because uh, the, the processor and things like that will draw more power as it needs to do more so the more power you give it the better off it can do doing its thing that way. USB keyboard is handy so that you can interact with it. Um, uh, little card reader either you've got this built in into your laptop or you can buy a USB one. This is how you take your card plug it in here and that's how you write the boot image of the software that you're using to this card that is then used by the Raspberry Pi. Um, a compatible Wi-Fi adapter, let me see if I got one in my pocket. Uh, the key word there is compatible. I've got so many of those in there, I don't know if I've got one in there. There it is. They make little small little USB Wi-Fi adapters if you don't want to hook it up via Ethernet and you want to play around with Wi-Fi, that's another way to go. Key there is compatibility. It's the chipset on here is what's the key as far as what works and what doesn't work with the uh, software out of the box. You can probably update drivers and things like that as people are, are working with this. There's a lot of momentum in this area with this device, so it's changing quite frequently. So uh, you want to go out, check the forums, check things like that so that you can uh, make sure that things are, you're, you're getting updates to information and obviously solutions and things like that. I've got a little U, um, H, I'm sorry, HDMI to VGA adapter. My monitors that I throw at this are old and cheap and only have a VGA port to them and not the new fancy HDMI as they don't need that. Um, other things, I've got a hard SIP phone. This one's by Polycom. Um, <clears throat> this one I'm running what's called with PoE or power over Ethernet so I don't have to plug a separate power supply in separate. And this is not your standard house phone. Um, you can, if you want to, use something like this. This is called an ATA or analog telephone adapter. It's got, this one happens to have three ports on the back. Ethernet, that's how you connect it up to your network. And it's got two RJ11 ports for line one and line two. If you sever your house connection to whoever your provider is and isolate your house from the, the provider, plug a cable here, plug it into any jack in the house, you have just become your own telephone provider for all of the phones in your house. Obviously newer phones don't have what's called a high uh, ring um, equivalence number, which means how much current it draws when you ring the phone. Uh, they're they're all pretty much electronic, so you don't, generally don't need to worry about that. If you've got those old rotary phones with bells that things go back and forth to make the noise, why, uh, yeah, you'll probably uh, give that thing a hard time. 
Um, what's the, what's the name of that device again? ATA, which stands for Analog Telephone Adapter. Um, you used to be able to hack the Vonage ones, which I'm sure is probably what this one is, to uh, de-register it from Vonage so that you could, you know, d can provision it yourself and give it the, the settings that you need to give it to um, work that way. Uh, tell you without having a network here, it's going to be kind of hard. Um, software. Um, oh, we will make the slides available afterwards, so if you don't want to take notes based on what I'm saying and things that I'm going off, if we had something behind us to see, that'd be good. Um, we will make those available. The software we're using on this is from an organization called PBX in a Flash. That's all one word, P-B-X-I-N-A-F-L-A-S-H dot com. They've uh, had versions of their software running for years here now and uh, when the Pi came out they ported some of their things over to that uh, and with their distribution and um, they've done a really good job of advancing it. I mean we're up to 3.7 now of this and they started with I think like 1L or something like that so they they're moving pretty quick. Um, there's generally a this one's safe to run, everything's working pretty good, no, no serious problems. And then there's the next version which is you're going to get a lot of arrows in your back because you're a total pioneer and they're springing a lot of stuff on you and things like that. It's not ready for prime time, that sort of stuff. You probably want to stay away from that unless you like messing around with that sort of stuff. Uh, other software that you're going to need, uh, I'm assuming you're going to probably do this from a Windows environment. Um, if not, uh, um, I'm not sure exactly how you do this on the Macintosh, but in order to write the image to this uh, chip that's in here, uh, you used a program called Win32 Disk Imager. It's a program that has a very simple interface. When you bring up the program, it uh, generally does a pretty good job of finding the drive letter associated with your little uh, your USB um, um, connector here and then a file name that you will then write to that and it basically just does a raw write of that file out to the, uh, the chip, uh, the card. And uh, you got to be careful, you can totally kill off your C drive or the most important drive, whatever it happens to be. Uh, so you got to be very careful and double check and triple check that you're writing it to the right place and things like that. Um, Power Archiver or like WinZip, the file is a tar.gz file with a bunch of things in it. One of them is uh, the MD5 hash. If you want to go so far as to go check that again, I basically go by if I successfully uh, unzip or untar or unrar or whatever the unword happens to be for that one is um, that uh, without any error messages that the internal checks on that are good enough for me. Uh, some people like to be hardcore do that. Another one is uh, if you want to save some money on a hard phone, you can go with what's called a soft phone. It's a, a software that you run on your computer that acts like a phone. It connects up to the server and uh, over the network and then you use either a headset or the microphone and speaker on your laptop or computer to uh, interface with that um, that way. Um, couple of soft phones out there. Counterpath has one called iBeam, E-Y-E-B-E-A-M. It's another company by the name of 3CX. They make a pretty good one that way. Um, other things that you're going to need is a Google account um, for uh, your uh, vo Google Voice account as well. Now when you set up your Google Voice account you're going to need to have it connect up to a Google Gmail account. Um, I got in on uh, Google Voice back when it was called Grand Central and I uh, had problems with my account because it was a, a non-Gmail account associated with it. I had to basically go back and create another account or use a different Gmail account and um, uh, create it and set it up so that it was using my Gmail account that way. I think as, part, as you'll see later on here they automatically append the at gmail.com for your username so if you don't have that right it's not going to connect up and, and authenticate correctly because it'll have the wrong information that way. 
Okay, well, it looks like deer in the head. Go ahead. I was going to say, finally a question. Okay, Good. Pretty good the details, like, just what, what's the why for it? Like, what are some features that you get that are better than the phone system? Or just um, features, um, it costs you a whole lot less. That's a pretty good feature for some people. Um, why you would want to do that? There might be some features in, in Google Voice that you might want to integrate in with your system, or uh, you just want to try it. Uh, a lot of times, uh, somebody has a great idea, and they go to the boss, and they say, hey, I think we could save money. That's typically the best way to get somebody's attention. We're going to save money by doing it like this or doing something differently here. Um, and they say, well, I'll prove it. And you're like, um, OK, let me spend $35 on some hardware. I'll get it connected up. I'll have one phone line. I'll show them the things that you can do with it. And um, then give it a test and maybe play with it for a while and give it to some user, see if you can make it work that way for them. And then if they like it, they might roll it out and do something more substantial. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, Google Voice a whole office that way? I'm sorry? Could you Google Voice for a whole office? You know, um, the one thing I have not done is, and I think this is going to be a problem, is having one box that connects up to a whole bunch of different Google uh, Voice accounts. Purely from the standpoint of Google's going to notice that and they're going to kind of go, um, you know, you may not want to do that. And I, Is there a way around that? I don't know. That's just a suspicion on my part. I haven't set up a whole bunch of Google Voice accounts, set up a whole bunch of configurations in um, Asterisk to do that so that we can um, test that and fire it all up and see if it all works. And then, of course, it's one of those things that might work for a while, and then Google catches on because they're doing their sweeps or something, and come back and say, oh, gee, there's 10 accounts associated with one IP address. Uh, I don't like that. Are they, you know. are they critical to the plan? Um, from the free aspect of it, yes. Uh, again, this is just to play around with. There are other thing, other solutions to that problem. It's what's called an ITSP, Internet Telephony Service Provider. You don't have to have the telephone company deliver you copper in order to get connected up to the telephone company. There can be companies, there, there are companies all throughout the United States and Minneapolis and St. Paul here that will provide telephone service for you over the network. Like Vonage, I'm sure if you've seen Vonage. Vonage doesn't bring a, a copper pair to your house. They send all of their uh, information and data and telephone service over the network, over the internet. So, Question, don't yeah. you still uh, need a DSL or uh, Cable internet? You, the question is, do you need, uh, what sort of internet connectivity do you need? You need high speed internet connectivity. Something with low latency is involved. Voice traffic is, is very critical from the standpoint of packets arriving in time, generally in order. If a few of them are a little bit out of order, it's not going to make a whole lot of difference because it's just a millisecond of sound and you're not going to really notice it. But if, if a packet that, or a number of packets that were supposed to arrive here right now arrive now, you'll notice that it's, it's in the wrong place and they're basically useless. If they don't arrive at the right time, you basically throw them away because it, it doesn't add to the conversation it's having. It just detracts from it because it's occurring at the wrong time. Um, so a high-speed internet connectivity, something like Comcast, uh, locally here from a cable company, they generally have very good down and up speeds. Uh, VoIP is one of those things because it's a bi-directional thing going back and forth. You have to be concerned about your uplink speed just as much as your downlink speed. Do you need to do any, um, put any software and or hardware to do any packet shaping in order not to lose quality on the phone? Generally, uh, unless you get to the point where you're going to saturate your connection, you generally don't have to worry about that. Um, in order to really do packet shaping correctly with VoIP or voice over IP, you need to do it at both ends. That means your internet service provider and also you because uh, they might be sending you more traffic than you can handle and you might be sending them more traffic than possibly than they can handle that way. So it's it's. There is such a thing as what's called uh, redneck QoS, which is quality of service, which is you find out what bandwidth you have and you just say, okay, I'm going to lop it off at 75%. As soon as we start to use more than 75% of our bandwidth, then I'm going to start choking things that don't matter so much so that the voice traffic gets through. So that's beyond the scope of this 
demonstration here. Um, caution, always run your Raspberry Pi behind a good firewall. Um, make sure that uh, you don't have any ports open needlessly, that uh, you don't need open uh, to get access. A lot of the traffic initiates from the Raspberry Pi. And um, did we ever get internet? Did you know? I think so. Okay, I'm going to restart this then. So that uh, you, you don't get any hackers. And if you only are connected to free services, there's only so much that they, so much damage that somebody can do by hacking into your system. But it is an issue. Another issue is just because it looks like a phone, people are going to assume it's a phone, and oh, bad things are happening. I'm going to here. I'll, I'll do that. <coughs> Bad things are happening. You need to call somebody to come solve the problem. So uh, 911 service, that's pretty important. Um, I wouldn't do the sticker on it that says, this phone doesn't work for 911. They're just going to freak out and try and use it anyhow or whatever like that. <laughs> Not read the sticker because it's an emergency. Um, um, there is some really good readme information with the distribution when you expand that file in there on how to set things up and get things going and, and um, what to do that way as far as uh, making that work. Um, PBX and a flash, uh, that's what we're using as I mentioned earlier. So far they've done a really good job of correcting problems. They're um, really on the ball as far as pushing the state of the art forward that way. Um, they've done uh, work in the past on this so that they're familiar with what needs to be done here and how to get it work in different environments. And this is obviously the probably the smallest slash cheapest environment they have going on that way. Um, current image is version 3.7. There is a 3.11. Uh, that's that bleeding edge, arrows in your back version. You probably don't want to play with that yet. One of the things I did just read recently is there is a hardware change that has come out to some of the more current or newer Raspberry Pis as far as memory structure. And so that they've had to go and make some changes to um, their software to get it to work with both the old and the new Raspberry Pi. So if at first it doesn't work the way you expect, chances are you probably have a newer Raspberry Pi and possibly older software. So you're going to want to be aware of that. Um, is that just in the Rev B? You know, these are Rev Bs because this is this is uh, this one's a 256. This is a 512. You can tell by the the um, mounting screw holes. If you see one with uh, a couple of mounting screw holes, it's at least 512. The older one doesn't have that, so that's just 256. Um, I don't even know if you can even get the 256 anymore. And for those people that were buying it early on, uh, I think some of the older revs of this software will work with a 256 and, and behave halfway decent. I mean, this is not a very powerful chip. The, that we're doing the things that we're doing on here is absolutely amazing. We're running Linux. We're running uh, MySQL, we're running uh, Asterisk, we're running all these, you know, we're running Apache on here. We're running all these things that are kind of robust, shall we say, software on a really small environment. So it's, it's amazing that this thing uh, works at all, to be honest with you. And for 35 bucks, that's incredible. Question? Uh, you, you kind of just spoke about my question, but it, I was going to ask if that boot image is dedicated only to using the Pi as a void server. Or if there's a way to do it in a more general... Um, you, you would use different software. PBX and a flash uh, is generally their software. The, the images that they have out uh, are uh, x86 based, shall we say. So if you have a PC, not too awful old, uh, that has uh, internet connectivity or ethernet connection on it and some things like that, you can load, you can create a, a bootable CD, boot up and install it on an older PC I or something like that. Is that the only thing you're doing with the Raspberry Pi? If you're using that boot image. Oh, are we doing anything else on there? Yeah. Uh, we haven't yet, but uh, as you'll notice, if uh, you get to it, and it looks like we're good. There'll be an environment, so. Fair enough. I mean, but it's not much processor, so. Yeah. The, the, you get a phone call going on, and then, oh, hold on, I gotta compile this thing up. <laughs> Dead air. Yeah. So. Uh, we're, doesn't look like we're connected up to the internet. Yeah. Shoot. 
I blame the previous session. Over. Yep, there we go. Give us five minutes to figure out there's no internet in the room. Yep. Um, you write that image to the card, and then you pull it out and plug it in. Make sure that the Raspberry Pi is not powered up when you either insert or remove uh, a, a memory card. That's generally considered bad practice. Um, one of the other things I'll tell you that I had to do with one, there's very little plastic as part of the holder that holds the card and its contacts against the contacts on the board and I broke the, I the, the edge thing. off. And so, <laughs> so what I did was I just stuffed a little piece of plastic in here that's gonna put pressure on it to, to put it back you know, uh, here so then I can still use it without having to complete, I mean, for 35 bucks, if you can get it to work again. Just a little tiny plastic. Yeah, just a real tiny plastic thing and uh, you wanna be careful about that. Um, I did it when I was trying to insert it into the package. Yep. So just leave that cut out. Yep. Put it later. Yep. Um, most of the cases you'll find have the card exposed like this, so it's easy to remove as opposed to making it bigger to kind of protect the card. So just a, a heads up on that. Um, let's see. I uh, did the power thing, plastic holder. Um, Simple connections on this. You've got your HDMI, and I've got an HDMI to VGA converter that uses power from the HDMI port, so there isn't an extra thing that you need to plug in and draw power from. Um, you've got the Ethernet port over here, two USB ports. Yeah, you, can, uh, you need to be careful about what you put in here that draws power from the USB port from the standpoint of something big and ugly and whatever like that. This doesn't have a lot of power, so you might want to have a powered hub if you need to plug something in there that uh, is going to draw power. Um, yeah. Sure. So I let's talk about strategies. So kind of what we talked about, like doing this, this would be great for your home, for a phone. I actually wouldn't recommend you come to my company. Um, we we do business accounts primarily, bigger billing accounts. But I, I do have a slide. We'll talk. I mean, there's a strategy. I mean, if you really want to do this, you could buy a phone number from a company out of Colorado called Vitality for four bucks a month. Get two inbound calls simultaneously. You could have people dialed in, two people dialed in 24-7 for the entire month, and then it's like a penny and a half a minute for outbound calls. And people totally overestimate their usage. So once you actually get down to that, you, you're gonna be paying six bucks a month for, for phone service. And there's a lot of stuff you can play around with. Yeah. So, um, I guess, uh, um. Yeah. I'll, I'll get that. We'll get that. Okay. Sorry, First boot. Let me see which one of these. This one. I'm going to shut this down. Actually, no, I'm not going to go through that. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, when it first boots up, you're going to want to have a screen hooked up to it and a keyboard hooked up to it so you can see what's going on. It's going to ask you a bunch of questions generally about um, how things are configured and how you expect things to run, uh, usernames, passwords, things like that. One of the other nice things that uh, PBX in a Flash is really good about is updates for like bug fixes or security patches and things like that. So one of the things that happens when it first boots up is that it goes out and it checks to see if uh, <clears throat> how many patches have I applied here numerically. I'm at 26 or 14. They're now at 17. There's you know a couple more I need to download and install. So it'll do all that sort of stuff automatically. Um, in the past, on the other images uh, for like the x86 and stuff like that, that's been free. They're trying to make a little bit of money. So for I think it's like $10 a year, they'll have it set up where you can automatically do this when it boots up. Yes, you can do it manually if you want. But like I said, just kind of throwing some money their way based on uh, kind of development work that they're working on. Um, Things that you'll have to remember about your Raspberry Pi um, is the IP address so you know how to get access to it. You're going to set up a web browser on a different computer to access the, uh, the uh, Apache server that's on here and get, able to get access to what's called free PBX. This is a framework 
that uh, is specially designed for asterisk in order to manipulate it. Asterisks is nothing more than tons and tons and tons of CONF files or configuration files. And um, to manipulate all of these the way they need to be manipulated, you need to have had a lot, a lot of experience with asterisk and it's all crazy and stuff like that. Free PBX totally makes it easy where it's all click and type and click and type and away you go and everybody's happy and it works just the way you want. There we go. Perfect. I'll show you, give you a quick demo of that this is I'll get out of the way. GUI <coughs> management is free and is included. It makes it really easy to do things like um, create another phone extension. You don't want to have huh? yeah. okay. I would talk more before I woke up with this feeling in my chest. Like and so we add an extension. A hard extension like this is going to be SIP, Session Initiation Protocol is what SIP stands for. And this is running on the Pi? Yep. This is running on the Pi, yeah. It's and a it's test for them. Slow Pi because we don't have internet and we don't have DS resolution. I think it's yep. causing us some problems. Yep. Um, He's going to add another extension. Any issues like once you um, have like a good power supply, have you had any issues with like the Pi crashing? No. Under certain no, it's, it's been pretty. It's been pretty rock solid. How long have you been able to leave it up and running continuously, roughly speaking? Generally, the plug gets pulled on it, you know? <laughs> that's, unfortunately, that's one of the problems with something like this is, I mean, how often can somebody just take your PBX, stick it in their pocket, and walk out the door? A theft, you know, that's an issue, and, and keeping kids away from it because it's now running something. But, I mean, if you're going to do anything important with it, you're going to want to um, test it, see how many simultaneous calls you can get going through it. Um, the thing that you don't want to do with the Raspberry Pi is called codec translation. And that is the telephone, when you pick it up and you talk into it, it takes your speech and it chops it up into little pieces and then it, it, it turns it into numbers and it sends it all to the other end. And it's that process of doing that as to what, what algorithm do you use to chop up all those little bits and send out. There's one that's called G711. That's what the telephone industry uses. It's a 64-bit uh, bandwidth uh, protocol and it chops it up so many milliseconds and, and transmits it over a period of distance, you know, and they reassemble it at the other end and then it turns into speech at the other end. There's other ones that compress the speech more, like for example if you have a cell phone, depending on your carrier, it's going to be GSM. That's a type of compression that's used to, to less, uh, to make the, the bandwidth uh, use less so you can send more information in less space. Another one that's really compressed is 729. But if you, and, and converting from one to the other takes time because you have to receive that packet, convert it, and then send it on. And the more time you spend in the conversion process, the longer the delay is for that person at the other end to hear your conversation. So that when you talk, you get into this, you talk, and then you wait because the person's receiving it, and then they're, send, they're talking, and then it gets translated and comes to you, and it gets to be like an old transatlantic or transpacific telephone call back in the 80s, if anybody's ever done that. You know, it took a while, you, you get into half duplex. I'd talk and then wait, they'd talk and wait. I'd talk and wait, they'd talk and wait. Um, so that takes a lot of CPU power, so you do not want to do any transla uh, codec translation. Uh, generally, you have to go out of your way to change the codec from the default of G711 on most equipment. The only time you really might run into it is with your provider. If for some reason your provider doesn't default or accept G711, which I think is still pretty rare yet, um, you shouldn't have an issue with that at all. Jason's setting up a soft phone here on his laptop. This is uh, the 3CX one, is it? Yep. And so it's now connecting up. And so if he were to pick it up and dial 301, this phone over here would ring. Oh, no. This, one's, this one needs to be rebooted, I think. No, it didn't. Yep. It was powered up before the Raspberry Pi was functioning. so. It's a polycom, it takes a little while to boot. It's one of the downsides to polycoms. Hey, um, What's the root password for the five? Um, <laughs> Change that. I did. So, got a piece of paper here. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Apparently, this is that one that he used for everything. It is. Where do you bake? <laughs> you need to keep too. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, yeah. You need to keep pass too. Yeah. Um, Are you going to make the slides available? And I'm sorry, one of these. We're you know, put them on our. So. But we'll give you some information at the end here about how to connect up with us afterwards. Um, there's, there is an ulterior motive to this, believe it or not. Um, let me see. Uh, with the free PBX, the, the passwords, the default passwords for asterisk in on the Raspberry Pi is documented, so you just have to go find this. There's a lot of information to, to digest when you're putting this all together as far as to go find this information, go find that information as far as like usernames and passwords and how to connect up and what IP address do I go to and how to log in and do all that kind of fun stuff. There's other things involved with this, um, things like um, your Google Voice details, setting up the Google Voice uh, the way uh, it needs to be configured within Google Voice so that it'll talk to your Raspberry Pi. You know, generally when you have a Google Voice account, you're going to connect it up to like say a cell phone or another phone or like that. We don't want it connecting up to a phone because we don't want a, a call coming into Google Voice to go to your, your existing phone. That way we want it to go through the Google Chat channel, which is how the Raspberry Pi connects up to the Google Voice so that the information then comes here. Why that phone isn't working? Oh, it's probably a password thing. Let me give you the IP here. This is 1.146, uh, Jason. If you want to log in and change what it's the Raspberry Pis to 1.16 from 1.4. Yeah. We'll get that going. Um, other things that you'll have to do with uh, P, uh, free PBX is set up uh, an extension for your phone, which you just saw him do. There's another thing that's called a, a dial plan, and that is when I dial certain numbers, what do I want the system to do? For example, that's one of the beauties of a VoIP system is you can have any number of phone numbers at any number of different companies all come to you. You don't have to have you know, one company that supplies you with phone numbers. You can get your 800 phone numbers from here. Uh, I want to have a branch office in Phoenix, so I have Phoenix phone numbers from some other company come here and uh, Minneapolis phone numbers from over here. The same also goes with your outgoing traffic. You can pick whoever you'd like to uh, send your outbound traffic. So you might be receiving a call from company A and then calling somebody else and going out through company B just because they're the cheapest. If you do business, say, in Europe or something like that, there's some really cheap companies in Europe to set up and, and, and get connected with and have an account with so that your traffic goes out that way instead of four cents or ten cents a minute for that call, you might be able to get, be able to, get it down to some, you know, fraction of a penny that way. Or if you're calling say, cell phones in Europe, which are more expensive, you, know, you might have a good deal through that way. So um, you, you want to be able to set up and say, if I dial a 9 first, I want it to go out this provider. If I dial an 8 first, I want it to go out this provider. Or uh, let the system potentially try and figure out. That's one of the other cool things about uh, Asterisk and Free PBX is you can have it go out and query these different companies and say, what's your traffic? going to cost for me to put it out to you and it's called least cost routing. So then uh, what will happen is, is you'll send that call out through provider B. Or the other problem you might have is you try and send a call out through provider B and provider B is taking too long to complete that call. You've got a timeout in your system. You send it now over to co company C and it's, this all happens behind the scenes from the person making the phone call and they don't know what's happening other than how come it's taking just a little bit longer for my phone call to get through. Um, that's what's called a trunk when you get connected up to somebody else that way. Test it, put in the information, call your Google Voice number, your phone should ring. Um, <clears throat> pick up your phone, try and call out, call your cell phone or something like that. Make sure it good, you get through that way so that things are working. Uh, one of the things that you will potentially have is what's referred to as one-way audio, which means when I call out through this system and talking to somebody else, I can talk and they can hear me, but when they talk, I can't hear me. 
I, I can't hear them. I'm sorry. I'll get that right yet. Uh, the reason for that is generally with what's called NAT, network address translation. That IP address that you get in your house or in your business might be what's called NAT, a network address translation. It's going to be like a 192.168 address or a 172 address or a 10 space address. And it's connecting up to the internet and using a, a router and a firewall and it's using a different public IP address as opposed to the private IP address space that I was talking about. And your firewall might not be very SIP friendly. That's the session initiation program, a protocol I was mentioned earlier on how things are going to communicate. Um, it might, there we go. Working, good. Now if we just had internet connectivity, life would be really good. Show you some voice stuff. Yep. Um, diagnosing that can be trouble. Uh, it's it's if you control the router. In other words, if it's a little black box that you have and things like that. Generally, like a firmware upgrade can happen, or you can possibly have to get a different one depending on how friendly it is to SIP traffic and things like that. Most of the newer hardware is going to be relatively SIP friendly from the standpoint of SIP's been out for a while. You know, because of the advantages of the world and other companies like that that have been doing voice over IP. Um, manufacturers had to up their game with producing a higher quality product that will be able to route this correctly. So that generally shouldn't be too much of an issue. When we get to the end, uh, what are you going to need? Um, go back a page. Oh, did you completely kill off my other one? Find an ITSP. As soon as you get this working, yeah, you may want to stick with Google Voice because you have a Google Voice account or whatever like that. Like I say, I don't know how well it's going to scale, whether Google's going to like having 10, 10 uh, accounts connected up to one IP address, but probably find an ITSP, an internet telephony service provider. Uh, obviously, the next thing you get working that way is E911, which is so that when you dial 911, you, your call gets routed to the correct place and they have the correct information as far as address for you and company name or uh, family name uh, if it's at home so that uh, you're protected that way. You don't want to have an issue where you dial 911 on your phone and you end up calling Arizona. It's like, what good's that going to do you? Um, other things that you're going to want to do potentially is, right now we only have two extensions, but you might want to add four extensions. You might find it convenient to have uh, a bunch of people be able to answer the phone uh, in your office or your home space that way. Um, make it convenient that way because you might have multiple phone numbers and you'll set it up so that this phone number rings this phone and this phone number comes in and it rings these three phones because these three people are responsible for this particular product or service or something like that and then uh, they can answer the phone and deal with it that way. Uh, then if they need to communicate within the company, they can do that. Nothing said that they have to be in the same physical location. It could be that I have a phone at my house, Jason has a phone at his house, you have a phone at your house, and we all connect up to the same server, and it's like we're all in the same office, but we're in different locations, and we can potentially, depending on the phone, see is somebody on a phone call? Do they have Do Not Disturb turned on, which means they're away from their desk or something like that? Uh, another one that's called Find Me, Follow Me. That's a really nice, convenient feature uh, brought about by Asterisk. When a call comes in, one of the things you can do is tell the Asterisk system through the free PBX interface is, this is my cell phone number. So when a call comes to my extension, ring my phone but also place another call to my cell phone with the same caller ID information and effectively whoever answers the call first gets the call. So that if I'm sitting in my office and my office phone rings, I'll pick it up and answer it there. If I'm out of the office, I don't need to do anything funky like forward it or do other funky crazy things like that. I can just walk away from it, leave, if somebody calls my office phone, my cell phone's going to ring and I can answer it and they don't know whether I'm in the office or on the cell phone other than the voice quality of say a cell phone call or something like that. And you can determine, do I want to answer this? Do I not want to answer this phone call based on the caller ID? You're getting the caller ID of the original caller as opposed to the caller ID of your PBX calling you. There are some reasons why you might want to do it the other way, but generally you want to get the information 
about who's calling you because it'll have it in your, your contacts and go that route. Um, and then if you don't want to answer the phone call, you don't have to. It'll go back to voicemail on the PBX depending on how you have the timeout set for things. And then, then the next thing that will happen is, if you'd like, is voicemail to email. Uh, so when somebody leaves a voicemail message, it will be emailed to your phone over the data network. Generally, people have these clever little smartphones and things like that where you can receive a, an email with an attachment. You'll receive a small attachment. Generally, it's going to be a WAVE file formatted in that G711 format. There is a program out there. Oh, what's it called? Remote Wave. Remote wave uh, free Remote Wave, actually, that will play those files. So you can listen to it. And depending on how you have things set, you can have the envelope as far as what time they called, uh, how long a message it is, uh, what number called, and with the caller ID information embedded as part of the audio portion of that. As far as the email with the attachment, you can have that information as well so you don't have to look. What's nice about the email uh, voicemail messages that way is, is let's say you're in doing something and you miss five calls and you come back out. A normal voicemail system, you have to call up and slog through those messages, five messages, Message one, then message two, then message three, up through five. We're out of time. Oh. Totally. <laughs> 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 no, I'm not done. No. Take a breath. I think real quickly, this was like the hundred thousand foot overview. Yes. So this software at the end, I mean, not on this hardwood, but you know, this software runs on a thirty-five dollar Raspberry Pi. We can cluster it. We can grow it out. Uh, we did on election day. We processed two hundred fifty thousand live calls with 500 phones, so I mean, this was just the really quick 100,000 foot overview. So if you wanted to know more, you can go, uh, first of all, if you go back to our session and go to my bio, I have a link to the, the meetup group for the Twin Cities Asterisk User Group, and they would say that it's not necessarily Asterisk User Group, it's more kind of like open source telephony group but we've never bothered changing the name or rebranding. Um, we meet the second Tuesday of each month at the Hack Factory, which is the Twin Cities Makers, Twin City Makers uh, Maker Space, which is over in uh, South Minneapolis, like 26th and 26th, That's something like that. And uh, we'll be meeting on Tuesday night, 6.30. There's information on the website. And that's where I'll post the slides once I get them corrected. So we apologize. We needed internet access. And I, we were doing great because we were doing the slides in Google Docs so we could both collaborate on them. And all of a sudden, we don't have internet. So we're, we're screwed from this. Uh, my bad. So anyway, but thank you very much. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you.